All right. It looks like it looks like we are recording. So let's see if we're up and running yet. Yes, I am definitely going to. I tried that a bunch of times already. There we go. Looks like we are live and good to go. I did. I did. In fact, uh, they can hear me on Facebook right now, but that's fine. There's nobody logged on yet. Uh, yeah, so there was some settings changed uh, on the iPad for the microphone because they used it for something else, and, uh, and I didn't know that. So last week we didn't have any microphone. This week, this week we do. Yeah, the camera mic picked it up, which just wasn't as good, but it, it was effective, I guess. I didn't have anybody tell me that they couldn't hear it. I am going to... I can't hear you. Is, is your volume turned up? Right. All right. All right. There we go. It's like my, my phone won't, won't turn on. Have you charged it? Oh, that might be it. All right. There we go. So now we should be good. <laughs> they picked you up on the delay. There we go. Now we're good. Now we're good. All right. Cool. What's up, everybody? Good, 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 good. I think everybody can hear me a whole lot better this time than they could last time. Sorry about that. Like you heard us talking about just a minute ago, we had a little microphone difficulty, uh, but the camera mic picked it up. So if you can hear me better today, let me know. If you could see me, let me know. Uh, I'm watching the feed here on my computer, so I can still see your, uh, your comments and questions and anything, so be sure and send those through. And as always, we're really glad to have Zach and Drew and Jacob and Cliff all in-house tonight because I really do prefer to do this in front of people. So I appreciate you guys being he out here. He doesn't like the online people. That's what you're saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, not such a subtle way. Uh, no, it's cool. Actually, I really do enjoy that you guys uh, tune in every week. Uh, the reason that we do this hybrid kind of thing is because I didn't want to uh, just abandon everybody who had been watching online. Uh, but obviously, you know, the guys wanted to get back together, and I definitely wanted to get back together with them too. So, Jacob, you know the drill with the AC, man. If you could, please. Thank you. <laughs> he's got that down to a science now, so he's good. Uh, but, no, I do appreciate it. We're just going to give it a few minutes to uh, let everybody get logged in here like we usually do. Uh, how was everybody's week? Good? good? Back to school? Back to school for you? Back to school for back you? To school tomorrow. Jacob, back to school. You're, you're all online or are you in person at all? Uh, all online. All online. So, yeah, I think that's Zach all online. You're all, all online too as well. Right? So. Well, I got some classes that are in person, but they're by myself, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> High five myself, no friends. Um, <laughs> no. You got that. another teacher for those classes, huh? I know that teacher's hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, this counts as one now, so, you know, you got to. Yeah. So yeah. No teacher for that elective. You <laughs> Agreed. But you've got no other <laughs> options. So. All right, looks like we got some folks logged in on here. Again, just let me know if you guys can hear me and if you guys can see me. I see we got a few logged on, so go ahead and drop a comment just to make sure that I can see that as well. I did put a link to the handout materials right here in the comment section this time uh, because I felt like this was a really important one to have, so I want you guys to make sure to, you can get it whenever you want it. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started like we always do. So you guys are very familiar with this screen by now, and uh, but you know the drill here. We uh, we definitely want to continue to pray for these things and for anything else that may be uh, maybe going on in your life here in person or your life out there online. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to send us a prayer request, or you know, you can go right to TanglewoodChurch.com and you can do it privately. And you know, if you don't want to share it publicly or whatever, that's fine. Uh, but we do ask that you that you reach out if there is a need. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and start with prayer like we usually do and, uh, and get started. <clears throat> so let's pray. So, Father, we come to you today just, uh, just grateful and thankful for all that you have given us. Um, Father, I know it's hard sometimes to look past what we don't have and, and, uh, and you know, just not see what we do have. But, Father, I pray that you would put, each, put that in each and every person's heart here, that uh, they, we would be able to step back and just realize what it is that you have given us. And, Father, uh, these, these prayer needs on this list here, uh, for the isolated, for the parents, for all the kids that are uh, dealing with school in a different way, uh, business owners, church leaders, uh, all of these folks that have to change the way that they do things. Father, we just, uh, we just pray that you'd be with each and every one of them and they can make the best decisions uh, to, to bring you glory ultimately. And, uh, and as we always do, Father, we just pray that you would be with all the first responders, law enforcement, military. Um, we, just, we just have a special place in our heart for them and we just want to make sure that you, uh, that you are looking out for them, Father. So, uh, 
With that being said, it's in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, guys, cool. I appreciate it. So cool, we got David on. I was hoping you'd get on there, David. Good to see you, buddy. All right, there we go. Well, cool. So I titled this one, what did I title this one? <laughs> Power management. I'm teasing you guys. Uh, I titled this one Power Management. And, uh, you know, we always talk about power. You know, we talk about horsepower. We talk about torque. We talk about electrical power, you know, current and that kind of thing. Uh, but what we're going to really talk about with our biblical tie-in today is, is God's power, the power of the Holy Spirit, obviously. And what we want to do is manage that. So I think we would all agree that we've been given some power in some thing, some way, some talent, some skill, something that we have. Uh, Pastor Stocks did a really good uh, sermon on that this morning. I recommend everybody check that out if you weren't here. Uh, but what's funny is before he wrote that sermon, I already had this written. So it's just one of those things that ties in perfectly together, you know, almost like it was meant to be that way. <laughs> almost uh, but what's really cool like I said I, I had already got put this together before his sermon today but it really fit nicely so uh, shout out to Pastor Stocks for that so let's talk about that a little bit short and sweet verse right here Proverbs 25 28 like a city whose walls are broken through not though like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self control now I could be a I could be accused of being uh, guilty of that sometimes, lacking self-control. But what are you really doing? You're, you're lacking power. You're lacking the power to control yourself in that, in that regard. Uh, for me, it's you know, usually losing it and throwing wrenches and kicking cars and doing all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but you know, self-control can be a lot of things. You know, it could be addiction. It could be, you know, it could be even things that you wouldn't think would be that bad, you know, like chocolate bars or, you know, just can't stop eating Skittles or whatever it is, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of control there that you need to maintain. And so it says right here, like a city whose walls are broken is a person who lacks self-control. Second Peter 1, 5 through 8, and I like this a lot too. This is another, uh, you know, talking about power that we've been given. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and add to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I really like the way that it's worded right there. So there's a lot of things that it says, you know, that we could add to our faith. You know, goodness, knowledge, self-control, there's that word again, kind of seeing a, you know, control, trying, trying to see a thing here. Uh, but to godliness, mutual affection, and love. But what I really like is it says, if you have these, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Now, most of the guys watching this out there and most of the folks here in this room, we're car guys. A lot of us are professional technicians, but even if you're not, chances are you do something. You know, you, you have a job, you have something that you do or something that you're typically uh, involved with, and nobody would want to be ineffective and unproductive, or at least I hope not. Now, I have worked with some guys before that seem to be pretty happy being ineffective and unproductive. <laughs> but we wouldn't want, you know, we wouldn't want that in our job, and we certainly wouldn't want that um, in our knowledge of Christ. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the things that it says right here. So with all this added to it, <clears throat> it will keep us from being in, ineffective and unproductive. Tim Platt, speaking of professional technicians, I see you're on here. Good to see you, buddy. Appreciate you tuning in. Uh, let's go on with our next verse here. 2 Timothy 1, 6-7. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And again, this kind of you see our tie-in here, power management. You know, so we're talking about the power, God's power. And it says, you know, very specifically right here, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. So that word timid, you know, how how do you how would you define that timid? Yeah, kind of, kind of shy, you know. I guess, or maybe, maybe shy is not the right word, but you know, not really standing up for yourself. I guess would be a way to say it. You know, that's the way I would say it. Um, and this is a really good, good word here too, because I think it's easy to be timid sometimes. Like I don't like confrontation, and you know, I don't think anybody would accuse me of being timid necessarily. But I don't like confrontation. It's very easy for me to walk away from an argument or walk away from, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't want to fight nobody, you know, but. What we need is we need to have God's power, love, and self-discipline because we don't want to be timid when it comes to, to 
the word. We don't want to be timid when it comes to, to spreading, you know, the word of uh, the gospel of Christ or anything like that. Uh, so we definitely need need to fan into flames the gift of God. And that's that's another thing that he's given us is that that power to not be timid, especially when it comes to, you know, anything having to do with with the gospel. And this is the one that I really wanted to get to because this is the one I feel like really kind of brings it home. The end of all things is near. Now, I could honestly just leave it right there. <laughs> and I think a lot of people would probably agree. Uh, yeah, Tim Platt says not confident. I think not confident is a really good way to say it because you could, uh, yeah, you could not be a shy person necessarily but not be confident. You know, even if you have the skill and you have the ability, uh, you could still lack confidence. And so, yes, I, I agree with that definition really good, uh, Tim. Good job. But the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And this is the one that really, really struck me. And, and it just so happened to really, really tie into what Pastor Stocks was saying this morning. I don't know if any of you guys got to, got to hear it, but he was really talking about using what you have. And he, he's preached a really good sermon on that. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. That was the three points that he made. Uh, but what was really interesting, like I said, I had written this already. And I had written it because it says right here, use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Now, is turning wrenches for a living a gift? I don't, I don't know. Some, some days it doesn't feel like it. Uh, but can I use that to serve others? You know, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, does it have to be standing in front of this camera or standing in front of you guys? You know, no, not necessarily. Um, you know, there were several occasions this week alone uh, where, you know, I was able to help out some friends in, in different ways. And, uh, and, that, and it wasn't necessarily because I had, you know, any money or, or anything that they wanted. You know, it was just using that gift, using, uh, you know, using the skill, using the ability, using the things that God has given me. Uh, as a way to serve others and, and do it cheerfully. And so that's, that's one that really hit me hard this week, and so I want to make sure we get that point across. Um, but again, this is about using the power that you have. And so I think each and everybody, you know, has got that, got that in us. Uh, and, you know, you never have more friends than when they find out you can fix cars, trust me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, no, it's a great thing because, you know, what's really interesting is that Yes, you know, if you can fix cars, you, you know, you can help people out. That's awesome. But whatever they are good at, you might need. And so it really kind of works out beautifully. Um, you know, I'm not a plumber. I'm not an electrician. I'm not a carpenter. I'm not, not a lot of these things. But, you know, everybody's got something that they do. And so it really works out well. So, yeah, I definitely wanted to get to that one because that one, man, that one really hit the nail on the head for me. And I hope it does for you guys, too. All right, let's get into our lesson. So, Drew, I hope you are paying attention, buddy. <laughs> uh, so, two major factors in power management, fuel and ignition. Now, these are the two things that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, this kind of ties in with what we talked about last week. So, last week we talked about, you know, the cylinder heads, the valves, camshaft um, placement, that kind of thing. And we talked about, you know, air pressure and how it flows through the valves and how ports will affect the different flow rates and that kind of thing. And we talked about compression ratio and all that. Well, all of that is kind of set once the engine is built. You know, it's, it's built with a certain compression ratio. It's built with a certain displacement. It's got a certain set of heads bolt on, bolted on it. It's got a certain intake, a certain throttle body. All of this stuff is all bolted on, and it's all hard parts. It, it is what it is. Now, does that mean that when you turn the key, that sucker's going to fire up and run great right out the gate? No. No, it doesn't. Um, and the reason being is because we need something to manage fuel and ignition. You could build the highest horsepower, greatest small block that ever lived, or you know, a high revving four cylinder, or whatever it is. Uh, but without proper fuel and ignition management, all of that other stuff isn't going to matter. You know, high compression, good flowing heads, nice camshaft. You know, all all the goodies, all the pretty stuff, uh, isn't going to matter if we don't manage fuel and ignition. So these are the two things that we're going to talk about tonight. So hopefully. You guys will gain something from this. And I'm going to take a sip of drink while we do that. So let's talk about the old days here, the calibrated fuel leak. <laughs> so if we're going to talk about fuel ignition, we kind of, kind of start from the beginning, right? So a carburetor in its most basic...
you know, lawnmower, motorcycle, car, truck, whatever, it doesn't matter. They work under the same principle. So the basic carburetor, this is just a basic one barrel, you know, design here. You, you know, you can see it's pretty simple, but they're designed to take advantage of Bernoulli's principle in that as velocity of air increases, pressure is reduced. Might want to write that down, just saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, the carburetor used a precision sized jet in the Venturi, allowing a very precise amount of fuel out of the float chamber. Drawbacks of a carburetor are its limited ability to react to changes in load, temperature, throttle position, and the inherent problem of fuel distribution in the intake manifold due to the need to keep the fuel suspended in the airstream. All right, so that's a lot of words there. I hope you guys online can see that just fine. Um, but what we're talking about here when we talk about a Venturi and we're talking about, you know, the, the various parts here, you see how this necks down? So if this carburetor were cut in half, you see it's kind of necked down right here before the throttle, throttle plate or between the choke and the throttle plate. And we've got a float chamber here with a float in it. And so this is allowing fuel to just run into this bowl and just keep this bowl full with a certain amount of fuel. Now, that little hole right there is what they're talking about when they talk about a jet. There's usually some type of metering device here. As air flows past this Venturi, it speeds up because of Bernoulli's principle, because as the speed increases or the velocity increases, the pressure drops. So as you get this pressure drop across this, uh, this chamber here, this orifice or jet, whatever you want to call it, that actually draws out a certain amount of fuel because the, the pressure is lower here in this Venturi than it is here or here. So it actually draws fuel out of the float bowl. And as this throttle opens up more and more air is rushing into it, that pressure drop is greater and it sucks more fuel into it. So that's why we call it a calibrated fuel leak. And that's pretty much all it is. It just leaks fuel into the engine at a calibrated amount. The problem is that they, they are very inefficient in, in reacting to changes. You know, they're, they're reacting to the velocity across the uh, Venturi. So if you open up the throttle more because you're climbing up a big hill, you know, they have a hard time reacting to load. Uh, you know, they don't know if you're in neutral or if you're loaded up fully. Uh, they have a hard time reacting to changes in air pressure, you know, the atmospheric pressure. They, they, you do have atmospheric pressure affecting this, but they have a hard time, you know, re reacting to changes in it because this jet is fixed, you know. Whatever the pressure drop across this is the amount of fuel that's going in it. That jet size doesn't change. So we go to EFI. This is where things get really good. So when you're talking about metering and monitoring fuel with EFI, again, the carburetor did a really good job of getting a certain amount of fuel in the engine, but it didn't really, it wasn't smart. It didn't know how much fuel the engine needed at any given time. It just reacted based on Bernoulli's principle. So with EFI, or electronic fuel injection, used in most every production car since 86, the EFI system uses a computer or some type of, uh, a computer of some type to control the amount of time each injector is open. Also important. Uh, <laughs> advantages. advantages include the ability through various sensors to adjust the amount of fuel being injected at any given RPM and load range the vehicle may encounter. It also compensates for pressure and temperature at any given time. So, we're going to talk about it in just a little bit, but you remember last week's class, we talked about air pressure. We talked about the atmospheric pressure. Well, that pressure changes, obviously, with temperature, humidity, uh, altitude. Those kind of things can affect. And we talk about those in a little bit, but today's lesson is more about the point of, uh, of the fuel and the ignition side of things. So single or multi-point EFI systems, multi-point has an injector located in each branch of the intake manifold below the throttle valve. So you see right here, our throttle valve is here. You know on that carburetor, the fuel was right there where the throttle valve was. And it had to travel through the intake and through the plenum and through all the winding path in order to get to the back of the intake valve. You know, you saw last week the shape of those, you know, cylinder head ports. Well, then you imagine you got the rest of the intake and everything. So that fuel had to flow through all that and stay suspended inside the, the airstream, because if it fell out, it would pool up. And if you got fuel pulling up in the intake, obviously that's doing nobody any good. So it would have to stay suspended. So you have to design intakes that would keep them, keep it suspended or, you know, you couldn't, uh, had to, couldn't make any sudden bends or anything like that. Well, with EFI, it's just air. It has to flow all the way to the injector. And the injector is placed really close to the intake valve. So, you know, in last week's class, we talked about the difference between port injection and 
direct injection, you can see here with port injection that it's behind the intake valve. It's actually blasting fuel right behind the valve. With uh, direct injection, the injector is actually right in the combustion chamber. And we talked about carbon buildup earlier, you know, but that's why, because there's no fuel in the back of that valve. <clears throat> but the injectors spray directly into each port, and the ECU controls the opening of the injectors, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But the main takeaway here is that we're only flowing air, so we can have a dry intake, you know, and that opens up a whole world of possibilities as far as uh, the way it can be shaped, the way it can be packaged, what they can do for, you know, to maximize flow uh, for whatever RPM range. So now you've got a whole lot of opportunities to, to do some wild stuff with intake manifolds, whereas with the carburetors you didn't. Measuring airflow. So we talked about this a little bit, uh, you know, just a second ago. So we said that the carburetor has a hard time. It doesn't know how much air is going through it. I mean, in, in a way it does. You do get a certain pressure drop over that jet, uh, but it can't measure it. It doesn't know exactly how much. It doesn't know how dense it is. It doesn't know the pressure of it necessarily. Uh, but with EFI, we can know that, and we can do it in a couple of different ways. But the reason it's important is that we're after density. We're after how dense the air is. Uh, that's the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, I guess, and in, in, in if I could sum it up, is that we want to know how dense the air is and how much of it it is being taken in at any given time. So the ideal gas law is really a, a law that is relating to the number of molecules in a given amount of air based on pressure, volume, and temperature. And those three things are super important, pressure, volume, and temperature, because all of those can change uh, the density of the air. And increase the number of molecules by increasing the pressure de or decreasing the temperature or both. And we don't have to work this law out. I'm not a physicist or chemist or whoever it is that, would, that came up with this. Uh, but what we, what we are interested in is that there's a relationship by increasing the pressure and decreasing the temperature will increase the density. And that's what we want. So that's where your, uh, you know, eBay cold air intakes make all their power, right? They decrease the temperature. <laughs> But it is what we're trying to do. We are trying to get the coldest, densest air we can into that motor because, well, I'll tell you why. Because we want the most mass. The most mass of air will allow us to use the most amount of fuel and make the most amount of power for any given condition. And we'll get to fuel measurement in just a second. But what we want to know first is air mass. Now, if you watched the class last week, you saw the, the slide I had on atmospheric pressure. This is just another version of that, which I thought was kind of neat. So, you know, we talked about last week that if you had a column of air one inch by one inch, you know, 370 or 380 or ever how many miles it is up, uh, you know, to that, to that top of the atmosphere, that it would weigh 14 and a half pounds. Well, this is kind of another uh, representation of that. That's a one inch by one inch square, and it goes all the way up to the top of the atmosphere, and it would weigh that 14.7 pounds. That's sea level or pretty close to it. But what's interesting in this uh, illustration is that you see there's more air molecules down here and there's less up here because as you get higher and higher, the air gets less dense. You know, it's like mountain climbers. They can't breathe, you know, when they get up there, you know, people that fly planes or whatever. So this, we're down here at sea level where it's pretty dense or at least at its densest, but up here it's not. So most of that mass that we deal with is down here. Even though that whole column of weigh, air weighs 14 pounds, we're dealing with the heaviest part down here at the bottom. I just thought that was a cool illustration about how altitude, you know, can affect it. But in engine management, we are most concerned with the measuring of the mass or the amount of air. Think about it as the amount of molecules. That's probably the easiest way. If you had, you know, marbles that represented air molecules, you want the most amount of marbles you can shove into it <clears throat> of air entering the engine. Since air density changes with temperature, humidity, and altitude, it is necessary to measure or estimate the density of the air entering the engine. Those three right there also may be important uh, <laughs> to somebody in here. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, that's why the air is less dense when it's really hot, because the molecules are further apart. There's less of them for a given area. When it's really cold, they're closer together. Um, yeah, yeah, and you add humidity into that too because now you got water vapor that has taken the place of, you know, it's displacing some of the oxygen. So now, you know, instead of having two oxygens, you got an oxygen and a water. Or if you live in North Carolina, seven waters and one oxygen. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, yeah, that's why, you know, it's affected by temperature and humidity and altitude. So all three of those can, can play a part. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, at least you learned something, right? Hey, we got some new guys joining on here. Eddie, Blake, good to see you guys. Uh, but cold, dry air is more dense than hot, humid air, and therefore has more oxygen molecules present for a given volume of air. See, Zach got to it just a little bit ahead of me. Uh, engine produces maximum torque at an air-fuel ratio of roughly 12.8 to 1. That's important in just in the next slide. In other words, we need 12.8 molecules of air for every one molecule of fuel. This is why the colder, denser air we can feed the engine, the more fuel we can burn, and the more power we can produce. So when somebody says air-fuel ratio, that's exactly what they're talking about. It's the ratio of air or oxygen, you know, really, in, in, in what we're talking about versus fuel because we want to match 12.8 molecules of oxygen or we'll use the word air but it's, it's really oxygen that we're after uh, to one molecule of fuel and so that ratio is very important and that's at, that's at uh, the maximum torque you know that's when the engine is under its biggest load and when it need, you need the most power well that's not always the case though right we're not always running around here at full throttle and full load and just slamming it to the floor and letting her eat. At least I hope you're not. I mean, you know, we do sell tires where I work, so that's fine, go ahead. <laughs> but for the most part, that air fuel ratio, it's a moving target because it's very, very dependent on the conditions. Is it low load, low speed, idle? Is it high speed, high RPM, full load? Are you climbing a hill? Are you towing a trailer? Are you, you know, what, what, are, what are we doing with this thing? And that's why that AFR is a moving target and that's where EFI really comes into its own because it can measure those conditions all the time and make tiny adjustments to keep it in the range that it wants it. So how does the engine measure the density of the air? Two major ways and uh, this slide also may be on the test later. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this. I am. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, I like it. I, I can see this open up a whole new possibility. Um, but no, this is uh, these are the two ways that the engines typically, you know, engine management systems, uh, ECU, PCM, whatever you want to call it, ECM. Uh, for the purposes of this class, we'll just call it engine management. Uh, that they measure the density of the air because, like we said earlier, we need to know how many molecules of air we're cramming into this motor so we know how much fuel it needs, right? That's the whole point of this thing. And there's two major ways we measure it. Speed density systems use a MAP sensor or manifold absolute pressure in conjunction with an air intake temperature sensor to calculate the air density using temp and pressure. Then, then this compares it to a VE table for the fuel requirements. So this system is pretty simple. And when you know you're talking about standalone engine managements, uh, you know, and things like that, race cars, and you're starting to build custom stuff or whatever, this is usually the way you go because this is usually the simplest answer. It's not a perfect system though. So what it's doing is exactly what it says. It's measuring the pressure and the temperature of the air entering the engine. And using pressure and temperature, you can figure out the density, right? Well, it then takes that and says, okay, well, I've got you know, this fuel load or this air load, whatever you want to call it. And it goes to a table and it says, all right, at this pressure and this temperature and this RPM, this is the amount of fuel we want to, we want to give it. So it's not entirely analog. It's not taking a direct measurement. It's a calculated measurement. So it does have a slight flaw in that it's not real time. It's not really measuring the amount of air that's entering the engine all the time. Now, it reacts very, very quickly, and you would never notice it, you know, just driving an everyday car. But in something that you're trying to make a max effort car out of or whatever, you know, you'd have to take that into account that it's not an exact measurement. <clears throat> but that's called speed density. The MAF or mass airflow sensor system you, it takes a direct measurement of the air entering the intake. Uh, it says entering the intake boot or ducting to the throttle body. I'm not sure why I worded it that way, but okay. Uh, MAF sensors use a wire kept at a predetermined temperature and measure the amount of current needed to keep that wire at a certain temperature, thereby measuring the amount of airflow moving over it and are very sensitive to environmental changes, though not easily modified. So kind of uh, talk about that for a second. What they're doing is that there's some tiny wires inside of these and some of them have a film, some of them have a wire, but they all work, you know, essentially the same way. And what the computer is doing is trying to keep that wire at a precise temperature. And when I say precise, I mean, you know, many, many decimal points, very precise. And the computer, because it's a computer, can do calculations really, really, really quickly 
it can actually measure the amount of current that it takes to keep that wire at a certain temperature. And that's telling it how many air molecules are going over it. Because as air molecules travel past it, it cools off and the PCM will have to ramp up the amount of current it takes to keep it at that temperature so it knows that X amount of air has entered, has gone past it. Uh, you know, and if obviously the, the opposite is true, if it's not cooling off very quickly and it can bring the amount of amps down, it knows that not very many air molecules are traveling over it. The problem with these, though, is that they're extremely sensitive to uh, unmetered airflow. Anyone ever heard the term unmetered airflow? Tim, I know you have. David, I'm pretty sure you have, too. But unmetered airflow is when there is amount is air entering not through the sensor. So let's say you had a mass air sensor car and, you know, three inches back there was a big crack in the intake boot. Well, that would be air entering the engine that didn't go past the sensor. So now you're lean. You know, now the engine doesn't know how much air it's getting because, you know, the air is traveling unmetered. Whereas with the speed density style ones, that's not a problem. As long as it's, you know, measuring pressure and it can read, you know, it's got an accurate reading of pressure and temperature, that usually doesn't affect it. So these are very, very highly uh, affected by unmetered airflow. Also, let's say you built, you know, some hot rod motor and you put the same mass air ma meter back on it. Well, the PCM has been calibrated to where a certain amount of amperage equates to a certain amount of air. You know, these things are very sensitive to that. You can't just take one off of one motor and put it on another because this has been calibrated to that engine size. So if you make modifications, then obviously you would need to uh, make modifications to the mass air meter too. One nice thing about these is, you know, is you can make, you know, with the speed density systems, you can make big changes to the car and it would still act okay. With mass air meter, you would definitely need to change it if you change engine size or, you know, something like that. But they're both, they both have their place and they are both very widely used. I've seen you know, GM and Ford have both gone back and forth as to which one they use. In fact, Fox Body, Mo uh, Fox Body Mustangs, you know, had both for a while. So, yeah, <laughs> so they, they use them, uh, they use both systems. But just keep that in mind, that's the two major ways that they're measuring the density of the air that enters the motor. And that brings us back to air fuel ratio. So that's one thing that uh, we talked about a second ago about the, uh, the ratio between the amount of oxygen molecules and fuel molecules. Well, that's all fine and good, but what do we want? You know, we said that it's a moving target, right? Fuel alone cannot burn. It must be combined with oxygen in the air to form a combustible mixture. The perfect balanced air-fuel ratio by mass is 14.7 to 1. Of course, this is taken into account gasoline. Uh, every fuel has a different stoichiometric ratio, but we're talking about, you know, pure gasoline right now. Um, this is 14.7 parts of air to one part of fuel. At this ratio, under ideal conditions, all of the fuel and oxygen will be consumed by combustion, and it's called a stoichiometric ratio. And that all sounds really good, but that only really happens under laboratory conditions. In an engine, at temperature, with varying load, varying speeds, and various, you know, everything varying, rarely will it be perfect. But with a stoichiometric ratio, that means that everything, all the oxygen and all the fuel is consumed, and there's no leftovers, right? And in a world where you know, emissions or everything, obviously that's what they want. But that's not always the best mixture for what we're trying to do. So best power is usually made a little bit rich, somewhere around 12.5. And 12.5, like I said, that number is referring to the parts of air to the parts of fuel. So 12.5 is less parts of air, right? So you could say it is less air or more fuel, either way, but we would call that rich. It is less than 14.7, less than stoic. Best mileage is usually somewhere around 15.5. That's usually what happens when you're going down the road and you're going 60 miles an hour, just cruising, you know, real light throttle. You, they're usually leaning them out. That, that number is above 14.7, so we would call that lean. And that's usually where you see, you know, your best mileage and everything, but you're not making the best power. AFR is above 17, we usually miss. It's a lean misfire. There's not enough, uh, there's too much air, not enough fuel to actually combust. You know, there's too many air molecules and not enough fuel. And AFR below 10 will usually cause flooding and plug fouling. If you ever seen a car, you know, especially old carbureted car, it was black smoke and just blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you take the plugs out and they're all jet black and everything. That's usually from really, really low AFRs, so really, really rich, which would be an excess of fuel. 
Uh, so, you know, it's very important that we kind of stay in this range. You know, this kind of 12.5 uh, to 15.5 range is kind of where we want to live. Uh, but with the varying conditions that cars operate in, that's why, you know, it really doesn't make sense to have one size orifice and just dump a certain amount of fuel in it all the time. Because, you know, if you want to make the best power, you've got to make it rich. And if you want to make the best mileage, you've got to make it lean. And so it's always a compromise. But with EFI, we can actually measure the amount of air coming in, measure the amount of load on the engine, and inject the precise amount of fuel all the time, which is why it's better. <laughs> and we talked about injection a lot. <laughs> David Clayton says, why are you always talking about my Chevrolet? Hey, man, I didn't bring up GMs yet. You're all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, everybody knows it's coming. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> so we talk about injection, right? And I've said, you know, the, the, the PCM injects a certain amount of fuel. And that's kind of a mis misnomer. I mean, yes, it does decide uh, how much fuel that the engine needs, but how does it actually get that fuel to the engine? Well, the injector is what we've got to deal with. Uh, they are typically sized in pounds per hour or cc's per minute, and all that means is their flow rate. Uh, it's kind of like a metric and standard type thing. You know, they can you can buy them in either way. You can see them advertised either way, uh, but pounds per hour is the amount of fuel in pounds because that's usually the way that engine management is uh, is expressed. The amount of fuel in pounds per hour. So if you held that injector open for an hour, how many pounds of fuel would it inject? And the reason that they use pounds is because they're interested in the density of the fuel as much as they are the density of the air. Um, so, you know, if you had less dense fuel, you know, you'd have less pounds per hour. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, or cc's a minute. You know, we talked about cc's earlier. You know, it's cubic centimeters, but it's a, more of a metric term. But they, they are sold either way. There are several types of fuel injectors based on the electrical impedance of their coil and their panel design. Yeah, that's just kind of a design factor. They're, they're usually two different ones. You have a, you can have panel type injectors or disc type injectors, and they've got some pretty fancy ones that are made uh, all kinds of wild ways. Let me make sure the guys online can see that. And all injectors work on the same principle, that they use pulse width modulation, in quotations, or percentage of on time to meter fuel. So what that means is that they're off and then they're held on for a certain amount of time, right? So the amount of percentage of on time versus on t off time is their pulse width modulation or it, is their duty cycle. I agree. <laughs> it's a lot easier to explain that way, but that's okay. We're not going to spend too much time on injectors, but I did want to touch on them because I kept saying, you know, the PCM injects or the computer injects or whatever, but it, it's not the computer that's doing the injecting. It's the injector. But the PCM are pulsed on by the PCM grounding the control side of the solenoid rapidly, measured in milliseconds. Injectors should never be run over an 80% duty cycle, and anything over that is considered static. Uh, <laughs> so that when you start modifying cars, you add turbos, you add big cams, or whatever you do, and you need more fuel because you've you know, got some way to measure it and you realize that it is lean at a certain point and you keep adding on pulse width. You, know, you keep adding on duty cycle until you get over 80%. And if that's not enough, then your injector is too small because once you get to 80%, that's considered static. These things are electromagnetic coils inside there. They can't be held on all the time. They have to be pulsed. And that's what the PCM is doing. So when I say that the PCM injects what it does is it knows the size of this injector, and it knows the pressure behind it, and it knows that if it holds it on for a certain amount of time, then a certain amount of pounds per hour, or cc's per minute, of fuel will be injected into that cylinder. And so, like I said, PCMs being computers can do these calculations very, very quickly. In fact, modern computers can look at an engine like it's standing still. Um, so even though this has all happened thousands and thousands and thousands of times, uh, you know, per minute, you know, when an engine's running, the PCM is fast enough to do all these calculations and realize that if I hold that injector open for 2.6 milliseconds, it's going to inject a certain amount of pounds an hour or a certain amount of cc's of fuel. And it's done the measurement on the air side and says, well, this is how much air we have coming in. This is how dense it is. This is the pressure of it. 
this is the RPM we're at, this is the low point we're at, so this is how much fuel I want. And it says, okay, open the injector for 2.6 milliseconds, and that'll be that amount of fuel. And they do this very, very well, and they do it very, very quickly. But if you get into a situation where you decide to pass somebody out on the highway, and you need all the power right now, the PCM picks up on that and says, okay, the throttle position is wide open, the load has gone through the roof, the airflow coming through is, has gone through the roof, we've done the measurement, we know how dense it is, and we want full power right now. You know, give me that 12.5 to 1 AFR that we talked about. And the PCM knows, okay, well, if I open that injector up for 12 milliseconds or 13 or 22 or whatever it happens to be for that particular engine, then it knows how much fuel that is. And it will put in that, much, that amount of fuel to keep that AFR right where it wants it. So this is the huge advantage to EFI versus, versus carburetors. Stock computers will usually have a plus or minus 25% um, in how much fuel they can add off of base map. I've never seen one go totally static, but I have seen them go 25% more than uh, what they were designed for. So they are, they are designed with a little, little bit of leeway in it. Um, in fact, I saw a GM go to 31% <laughs> one time. There you go, David. There's your GM one. Uh, yeah, massive, massive vacuum leak, and it was adding 31% uh, fuel. So what that means is that it has a base map, it knows the engine size, it knows, you know, has everything been mapped out and says, okay, for these conditions, this is the amount of fuel I want. But then it uses the oxygen sensors, which I don't have slides on because I wasn't going to talk about that tonight, but it uses the O2 sensors to read what happened. So it, it tells the injector to stay on a certain amount of time. It does. The O2 sensor measures oxygen in the exhaust or leftover air, you know, if you want to call it that. A lot of people think they measure uh, fuel, but that's not the case. They actually measure air, measure oxygen. Uh, and it uses that to determine, okay, we need to add a little bit more to get to that certain AFR that we want. And so it'll turn the injectors on a little bit more. Or if it says that's too much, we need to add 2% less, it'll go negative, negative 2%. And most cars run in a, a, a fuel trim between you know, plus or minus 10% at any given time. But I have seen them when they go really lean, big vacuum leaks that will go up to 25 and 30 percent. So it's adding, you know, it, it looks at the O2s and says, nope, we need 10 more. Nope, we need two more. We need five more. And it gets all the way up to 30 percent or whatever it is. But eventually it does cut them off. I don't know if it does it at the 80 percent duty cycle or not, though. And that's because it's trying to get back to... It's trying to get back to that AFR. And that AFR isn't always 14.7 like we talked about, but it is always a target. So, like I said, if it's wide open throttle, it might be targeting 12.8. If it's, you know, part throttle cruise, it might be targeting 17. But it's always trying to get to its target AFR. And if it has to add 2 or 3% or subtract 2 or 3% to get there, that's what it will do. Um, and like I said, most, most factory cars run plus or minus 10%, but I've seen them as high as 25. Usually after about 15 or 20, you start setting codes. PO 171, lean codes all the time. Um, and a lot of that has to do with unmetered airflow, vacuum leaks because you got all this air entering the engine that's not being measured. So on the exhaust side, it measures a whole bunch more air than it measured entering. So it thinks it's really lean, so it just dumps fuel on it. Um, Gary Wojcicki, I don't know if you're watching tonight, uh, but this is a really good example of what your engine was doing uh, this week. And I won't go into the whole thing, but when we talked about it, you know, talked about the fuel trims being so high and about it dumping fuel on it, this is why. It was seeing an excess of oxygen that it thought had come through the engine and, you know, was trying to compensate for it by dumping on a whole bunch more. So, anyway, <clears throat> my, uh, so we talked about, we talked about how much air we needed. I'm not going to go over this whole formula, but I do suggest that certain ones of you uh, download these materials and go over this formula because you will need to know it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> brake, for, brake specific fuel consumption, or BSFC, is a measurement of how much fuel is needed per horsepower at the power peak. Uh, fuel is measured in pounds per hour. Like I said earlier, it's because they want to measure it, you know, the density of the fuel as well. Gasoline engines usually run in the 0.45 to 0.50 range. E85 is a little bit higher because it takes more E85 to make the same amount of power. Um, then, you know, there's, it's just lower in, in power density than gasoline is. Uh, so horsepower times BF BSFC equals pounds of hour fuel required. Example, <laughs> 400 horsepower times 0.050, it's gasoline motor, equals 200 pounds 
an hour fuel required. Now, notice in this example, we don't know what engine size that is. We don't know how many cylinders it's got. None of that. But it doesn't matter. Because if we're looking for a certain power output, it takes a certain amount of fuel to make it. That's right, and that's exa Zach brings a perfect point. So if this were a four-cylinder making 200 or 400 horsepower, well, we need 200 pounds an hour of fuel at power peak. Remember that, it's a power peak. Just to make 400 horsepower. Yeah, we would have to have 50 pound per hour injectors because we've got four injectors, four cylinders, and we need 200 total. Each one is like 100 horsepower. That's right. Now, if we got a V8, obviously we would need 25 pound injectors. That's right. You would need smaller injectors, but because you have more of them, you can get away with smaller ones. Well, you'd have to have smaller ones, actually. Uh, but yeah, that's a really, really good illustration of it. It doesn't matter what it is that you're, well, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter, but you, if you're looking for a certain power output, you can calculate how much fuel you'll need. And then that'll give you a, an idea of how big of an injector you need. I had somebody asking about this recently. Uh, John, Dr. John, if you're watching, you were talking about uh, fuel injector sizing not long ago. Uh, this is how I came up with the number I gave you. Uh, but injector sizing is critical to an engine's performance and efficiency. If an injector is too large, it cannot be controlled effectively when fuel demand is low, such as the idle or part throttle cruise. If an injector is too small, the duty cycle or on time needed to supply an ample amount of fuel under high load and wide open throttle will not be sufficient and the injector will go static or over 80 percent duty cycle. Injector sizing, fuel required at max power and pounds per hour, that's what we talked about, divided by the number of injectors, divided by the duty cycle max, equals injector size. So for our 200 uh, pound per hour, eight injectors, 80 percent duty cycle, 31 pound per hour injectors for V8, which gives us a 80 percent or you know a 20 percent cushion. Because we know the last uh, the last calculation was done at 100 percent, but we're not running at 100 percent. So you know, we, he said what 25 pounds uh, is what it would be for a V8, but it's actually 31 pounds if you take into account the 80 percent duty cycle. So it leaves you a little bit of safety net there. This is a VE table. You guys have seen this a whole bunch of times, I'm sure. Uh, what's really interesting here is that you can kind of get a really good visual representation of what the car is actually looking at when we talk about looking it up on a VE table. We talked about that with the speed density. Uh, and this is what it's doing. So this side right here is air pressure in, or manifold pressure in KPA or kilopascals, uh, which is what I prefer to read. You know, you could read that in inches of water or inches of mercury or whatever, but kilopascals are easier to me because it's 100 at atmosphere and anything less than that is vacuum. So anything over 100 is boost or pressure, positive pressure. So I like, I like to read it in KPA because it's just easier. And then this is RPM. So you can see we're running about, I don't know, 70 KPA right there and 500 RPM. That's, yeah, I don't really like that. That's, that's kind of not a lot of vacuum for this particular vehicle, but I don't know what this is off of. I'd like to see that KPA down a little bit lower. That would be higher vacuum. But regardless, you can see as pressure changes. So if you open that throttle up wide open, then you would see KPAs go up to 100 because now you've opened the throttle plate wide open and atmospheric pressure is rushed into the manifold. So now the pressure inside the manifold and the pressure outside are the same. So you'd see that 100 KPA. And as engine RPM increased, you'd see it move across here. So it's same thing with uh, idle, you know, deceleration. If we're out on the interstate, we're cruising at, you know, 3,000 RPM and we got a pretty mid range, you know, manifold pressure, and you lift off the throttle and high vacuum all of a sudden, you know, vacuum shoots up because you close the throttle, you know, against the engine, you would see that drop down into the deceleration part because now the RPM is up here, but you've closed the throttle and now there's a huge, you know, pressure differential there. So you'd end up with a lot of vacuum. And what these numbers are doing, this is a AFR target table. And you can see that, you know, we want 12, 9, 12, 7, 12, 5, you know, high RPM, high load. This is like wide open throttle situations. Uh, down here in this cruise area, you know, it's 15.7, 16.5, 14.6. You know, we got it leaner down here. Try to get, you know, decent fuel mileage, make it respond. Uh, deceleration, obviously, we're going way lean because we slammed the throttle shut, so we want to pull as much fuel as we can out. And then idle, you know, the engine's typically idle around stoic, you know, maybe a little bit richer depending on, you know, camshaft and all that. But this is what you're, this is what you're building when you're building standalone fuel systems. 
uh, or when you're talking about tuning standalone fuel systems, this is the idea. Like you can change every box. Yep. You can change every box and, you know, using a dyno, a steady state dyno, which I think Danny ha has actually out there, you can actually load it to every RPM and every load point, read the AFR, and, and put in whatever how much fuel you want, you know, to, to, make, to reach that AFR. Usually I don't use AFR tables when I'm tuning. I use a VE table, but the idea is the same. They look identical. It's just the numbers are a little different. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, what is, that's what you're getting when you're talking about EFI. You're not getting this with a carburetor. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not able to change 144 points or whatever it is uh, to whatever it is that you want. And then not to mention all the transitional you can change. You can change, you know, you can have it more or less fuel based on temperature. So yeah, this is really nice, really nice example of that. And it looks like my feed might have froze up. I hope not. And can, it, can somebody check that for me? Because yeah. I think I'm froze up on here. It might just be my computer that froze up. I don't know yet. If you guys can hear me or see me out there, let me know. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. It looks like looks like that was just a short little freeze up deal. All right, cool. Well, we are running out of time very quickly, and I wanted to get into ignition systems, uh, but I don't think I'm going to have the time for that tonight. So, we kind of. We kind of spent some time on the AFR parts, which I really like. So I will save the ignition stuff for next week. So you lucked out a little bit. But, <laughs> uh, but I didn't get a chance to stop and, uh, and ask anybody if they had any questions, comments. Uh, Linda's let me know that, that we are back broadcasting again, so I very much appreciate that. Uh, you guys out there on Facebook, uh, Tim, David, you know, if you guys are, are still with me, uh, shoot me some questions, you know, comments, whatever, whatever you got, uh, and we'll we'll take the last five minutes or so and just have a little discussion. I've got another section on ignition systems, but we'll save that for uh, for next week. So, uh, anybody good? Yeah, makes sense. You've been quiet, man. It's because you know all this already. Is that? Knows almost about, uh, almost as much about this stuff as I do. So. Well, y'all both must know a lot because y'all ain't got no questions. Yeah, so. <laughs> you know, we look at this kind of stuff for fun. This is, this is our fun. <laughs> Linda, Gerald. I'm about to go to bed. This, I just look at all this kind of stuff. Dude, you joke, but I have books on this stuff, man. I really do. I really do read this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Oh, man. Well, you know, Linda, if we got another hour, I mean, I got it in me. You just let me know. Uh, <laughs> she's disappointed we're not doing ignition systems, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that's all right. Uh, well, if the guys online uh, don't, have any, don't have any questions or anything, uh, I hope you gained something from this. Uh, this is the type of thing that I'm really passionate about when it comes to cars in general. Uh, standalone fuel systems are what really really made me want to do this for a living. Uh, I don't get to do that on a daily basis uh, because, you know, most cars are not adjustable. I just spend my time kind of diagnosing them and repairing them. But most of what I deal with can fall into this area, into engine management, because, you know, if a MAP sensor goes bad, if you got a vacuum leak, if the mass airflow isn't right, if the throttle position sensor fails, if you've got carbon on the intake valves, or whatever the case is, it can affect obviously the way the engine performs and when you start talking about engine performance you start talking about getting into the data seeing what it's doing is it adding fuel is it subtracting fuel is it you know all of its sensors reading correctly uh, so this is 90 percent of what i do when it comes to, to drivability diagnosis and then when you start talking about standalone it gets even better because then you can build whatever you want and you can inject it and make the fuel in and timing whatever you want and then it gets really fun um, those three cars that were in the beginning uh, the reason that i chose those and we'll go back to those real quick since I've got about two minutes. Um, the reason that I chose this for our cover picture, uh, that is a 72 Toyota Celica. That's a 76 Datsun 280Z, and that's an 84 Mazda RX-7. I think it's an 84. It might be an 86. I'm not sure. 
Uh, but the reason I chose all three of these is because we were talking about standalone engine management, and I built and tuned the engine management on all three of these cars. Um, and when I say I built and tuned, uh, they were all kits from DIYAutotune.com, and you actually solder all the components onto a PC board, uh, wiring them into the car, and then getting out a laptop and writing your own VE tables. I soldered the uh, for that. Fair, yeah, that's fair. true. You would, you would like that. Yeah, you? yeah. So Zach actually brings up a really good point. For the Celica, he was 11, I think. Yeah, we've been here about eight years, so he was younger than 12. Uh, so my 12-year-old son actually soldered the components onto the board for the PCM for that car uh, after watching me do it for the other one. <laughs> and then after seeing how good these two ran, uh, my buddy wanted me to do his RX-7 there too. Uh, but I say all that to say this is really what I enjoy about, about working on cars. This is one of the sections that I really like. Uh, this picture was taken on our way to Road Atlanta from Virginia Beach. So we actually drove all three of these cars to Road Atlanta, had a ball down there for four days, and drove them all back um, on standalone engine management. So it's definitely something that I would recommend you look more into if, uh, if this is your bag. Uh, <laughs> Lynn says he ran my GMC into the ground, too. Yeah, well, you know, I didn't do that. You can thank GM for that. Uh, <laughs> but if that's all we got, guys, if you guys got no... Uh, no questions or anything. We'll go ahead and pray and, uh, and get out of here. Yeah. And um, what, would a, what would a turbocharger or a supercharger do to the AFR if it would do anything? That's, a, that's an excellent point. So we actually talked about, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, actually, I'm not going to go back to the tape. I'm going to go, I'm going to go here. So what's interesting is, so you said, what would a turbocharger or supercharger do to the AFR? Excellent question, and I'm going to let you answer your own question. Uh, um, <laughs> well, I regret asking a question now. <laughs> so, with pressure and temperature, it changes the density of the air, right? Mm -hmm. And with a supercharger or turbocharger, what are we doing? We are adding more air than that engine would normally intake by itself, and so that air is under greater pressure, right? So, because it's more dense, you got more air. The AFR would go, it would go lean uh, if you didn't do anything to compensate for it, obviously. Uh, so if you just bolted a turbo onto a stock car and turn it loose, you would jam a whole bunch more air uh, into that engine, but you had no way to tell it to add more fuel, then it's going to go very, very lean because now you've got all that extra air. And if you want to get into the really nitty gritty with turbochargers, you know, when you compress air, it, get, it heats up by nature. Uh, that's what intercoolers and, and you know, post coolers and pre-coolers and all that kind of stuff do. Uh, you know, because when you compress air, it gets hot. Well, hot air is less dense. Uh, and so we want the coldest, densest air we can get. So we try to add intercoolers and everything to try and make them, uh, make them cool down below, you know, below too bad. Because if the air gets really, really hot, you can also run into a, a, a lean situation. Well, not only lean, but you can also run into high combustion chamber temperatures too. That's why you can't put as many units in the room because you need so many. Yeah, and that's and, and Zach is actually right. So you know, if it's a factory turbo car and you're turning up the boost a little bit, most likely, like I said, most most OE cars can tolerate you know 25 percent plus or minus. Would I want to drive it around like that all the time? Probably not. But if you're adding a turbo to something that never had it, then it has no way to know. Hey, we need to add more. We need to add more fuel because we are over a certain, a certain kilopascals, over a certain pressure. And Zach wanted me to go back to the chart, and this is why. So here we got 100 kPa. So that's atmospheric pressure. Well, with the turbocharger, supercharger, obviously we're going over atmospheric. We're adding boost. So you would actually need a fuel table that would go, you know, 200, 300. You know, they have two bar or three bar map sensors. Uh, you would need to read whatever it is that you want to read. And then you would build this fuel table look exactly like that, except at the top of it, it would be at your top of your boost range. And at the bottom, it would still be, you know, non-boosted vacuum, whatever. And you still have crews in the middle. So you would actually set it up very similarly. Does the, the KPA include that comes from your um, manifold pressure? That's right. That comes from the map sensor. Yep. Uh, and like I said, you can buy, you know, two bar, three bar. They probably even make four bar KPA sensors now since, uh, since you know, people have gotten pretty wild with boost. Uh, but yeah, when you add turbocharger, you are, you are essentially adding air. That is the whole the whole name of the game. Uh, and anytime you add air, you need to add a you know 
the required amount of fuel to match it. Uh, and that's where it really comes in, in the real play to have temperature involved. So you want to keep temperatures under control. Because you can add a whole bunch of boost, but with no intercooler, it's going to be real hot air. <laughs> and you're going you're gonna, to gonna burn something up. Uh, but yeah, for the... Uh, but with standalone EFI, obviously, you can compensate for that. So, Cool. Well, that was a good question, actually. That was really good. Um, well, good deal. All right, guys. Well, let's go ahead and pray and, uh, and get on out of here. Uh, Father, thank you for this time that we get to spend together. Uh, we just pray that you would, uh, you, you would just be with each and every person in this room and, and each and every person who may watch this online later or who's watching with us tonight live. Father, I'm just thankful for each and every one of them. I... Uh, it's the reason I do this. I hope that somebody gains something from it, and I would just pray that you would uh, you would be with me throughout this week, and just help me to uh, to be that 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 person you would have me to be, Father. I know that we've all fallen short, but uh, but Father, I just would pray that you would help me to be closer to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we do this. Amen and amen. All right, guys. All right, guys out there. I appreciate you tuning in. As always, you know we'll put the uh, links or the uh, description for the Hand out. My materials in the description, and I'll put up the YouTube link later on tonight as well. So don't be afraid to hit me up with some questions or comments after this goes up. Uh, I still read them, and I still get them, and so I would love to hear from you. I appreciate it. All right.